experiment that asked a big question. What would happen if you put the most active volcano on the planet in the wettest place on the planet? And then made it all so remote that everything that happened here happened in complete isolation from the rest of the world. Now we know what would happen. Hawaii would happen. This is the story of the intricate web of connections that made this 350 mile long island chain what it is today. Thousands of miles from the nearest land, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, almost a million years ago, the youngest of the Hawaiian Islands, called Hawaii, or the Big Island, was busy being born. But not up here. Down here. More than three miles below the Pacific Ocean, there's a point of weakness in the Earth's crust, known as a hot spot. Superheated molten rock forced its way out, billowing into the ocean, where it instantly cooled and hardened. Over hundreds of thousands of years, the lava gradually piled up, layer upon layer, higher and higher. Measured from the sea floor, the big island of Hawaii is 4,500 feet taller than Everest. It's so tall that it supports 11 of the world's 13 climate zones. Despite being in the tropics, its peaks are capped with snow. And the Big Island is still growing because the ancient hotspot below it is still active. And it's still plenty hot. Hot enough to make a complete spectacle of itself courtesy of the world's most active volcano, Kilauea. Kilauea produces enough lava to pave 20 miles of two-lane highway every day. The hot spot forms the Hawaiian Islands, and the islands in turn form a 350 mile barrier to the prevailing winds. The trade winds, to be precise. The trade winds blow east to west near the equator, meeting no obstacle for hundreds of miles. until they reach the Hawaiian Islands, which sit directly in their path. Hitting this enormous barrier depletes the force of the wind and leaves a trail of calmer air to the west of the islands. In 2001, NASA scientists discovered that this wind trail extends not just a mile or two, but for nearly 2,000 miles, 10 times longer than any other wind trail on Earth. And it causes a mysterious effect unique to Hawaii. The wind trail drives a current of warm water that stretches all the way to Asia, over 4,000 miles a quarter of the way around the globe.
These calm, warm waters are the annual destination for one of the planet's most magnificent species, humpback whales. these gentle giants gather off the western coasts of Hawaii than anywhere else in the Pacific. They travel over 3,000 miles from the North Pacific because Hawaii provides a safe haven to breed and raise pups. Far away from their chief predators, Alaska's killer whales, But there's a price to pay for peace of mind. Humpback pups can feed on their mother's milk. But for the adults, there's nothing to eat. This area is so low in nutrients that scientists call it a pelagic desert, a desert in the open sea. It's actually the lack of nutrients that makes Hawaii's abundant marine life possible. It all begins with the coral. Coral is part plant. To survive, it needs sunlight for photosynthesis. It needs clear water. If the ocean here were rich in nutrients, algae would breed, clouding the water, starving the coral of light. So the same expanse of sea that's a bare cupboard for humpback whales is a paradise for coral. And coral is the indispensable ingredient in Hawaii's unique underwater ecosystem. A quarter of the fish that evolved here are found nowhere else on Earth. Some are very strange indeed. To catch their prey, these Hawaiian garden eels disguise themselves as grass. Little cleaner wrasse work hard to make a living. They run a cleaning and parasite removal service for bigger fish. and they throw in dental work for free. But Hawaii's coral reefs are more than just home sweet home to exotic species of fish, a lot more. They are the last link in the chain of phenomena that creates these monsters. ending in a long saga that begins with powerful storms in Australia to the south and Alaska to the north. These tempests drive waves across vast distances toward Hawaii. As they travel, they join together, creating huge Pacific swells. 
But monster surf is not caused by waves alone. It relies on something else, something bigger, something Hawaii also has one or two of. Volcanoes. The runny lava that builds the Hawaiian Islands, called Pahoehoe, spreads out and forms gentle slopes as it solidifies. But when the lava hits the sea, it cools rapidly, forming steep underwater slopes. It's this hard fact that the waves come up against. When one of those gigantic Pacific swells crashes into these steep Hawaiian lava slopes, it gets pushed upwards, driving the wave higher and higher. Until finally, it hits a coral reef. The reef puts the brakes on the water below, but the water above powers on. And the wave breaks into a perfect barrel. of years ago, in dugout canoes like these, Hawaiian fishermen would speed their journey home by catching a big wave back to shore. This turned out to be so much fun that they started making special boards to ride the waves and competing to see who was the fastest. Soon they had invented a sport they called Hei Nalu. But there would have been no Hawaiians to invent surfing, if not for some help from a most unlikely character. A bird, the Pacific Golden Plover. Every winter, these birds migrate from the South Pacific to their breeding grounds in the Arctic, pausing in Hawaii for a pit stop. Just 1,400 years ago, the Hawaiian Islands were uninhabited, undisturbed, undiscovered, a good place to take a breather. The golden plovers set off from south to north as usual. At this time, they were being watched by South Pacific Islanders, the Polynesians. The Polynesians had colonized many South Sea Islands, spread over thousands of miles from Tonga to New Zealand. They were fearless seafarers and master navigators who were always looking for new territory. When the plovers flew overhead, the Polynesians suspected the birds might be heading for islands they hadn't yet explored. So they followed the flock into the wild waters of the North Pacific.
they couldn't keep up with the streams of birds for long. So each year, they would wait at the same place they'd lost sight of the birds the year before and pick up the chase when the plovers passed overhead. In a remarkable feat of generational stamina, the Polynesians tracked the plovers for almost 400 years. But it paid off. Around 1000 AD, the golden plovers led them to Hawaii. For the seafarers who first laid eyes on it, Hawaii must have been an awe-inspiring sight. But before the Polynesians could become Hawaiians, the islands themselves would have to undergo a dramatic transformation. had discovered Hawaii, but if they were going to settle there, they'd have to find some basic necessities. Fresh water was no problem. It was abundant on the islands, and although there were no large mammals a thousand years ago, the place teemed with fish and birds. But one vital piece of the nutrition puzzle was missing. Carbohydrates. Fortunately, the Polynesian adventurers hadn't come empty-handed. They brought an old and trusted friend from their home islands, the taro plant. Wherever the nutritious taro thrived, the Polynesians could thrive. But lush as it may seem, Hawaii was not, in fact, an easy place to grow food crops. Its volcanic geology can lock away crucial nutrients like phosphorus so plants can't get to them. Luckily, Hawaii's lava landscape presented not only the problem, but the solution. Volcanic rock is tough, but it's no match for Hawaii's plentiful rainwater. More than 22 billion gallons can wash over the islands every day, leaching nutrients from rock and organic matter along the way. By the time it's funneled down to the valley floor, the water has become rich in the nutrients plants depend on. And here, Hawaii's geology teamed up with the taro's biology. Where most plants would drown, taro has a kind of breathing tube in its stem that allows it to prosper in Hawaii's waterlogged conditions. The Polynesians pounded the taro into a carbohydrate-rich paste, poi, a Hawaiian staple to this day, which can resist spoilage for years. And Hawaii had another gift for the Polynesian farmers, one they'd never encountered before in all their wanderings. It came from up here, the Big Island's volcano. Mauna Kea. Twenty thousand years before the first human walked on Hawaii, the Earth's orbit around the sun changed, shifting the tilt of the planet by two degrees. The planet was plunged into an ice age. The sudden big freeze created an ice cap right on top of Mauna Kea which proved to be a very lucky thing for the Polynesians. 
lava erupting under the ice cap cooled much faster than it ordinarily does. The quick chill produced a super hard rock called Hawaiiite. Hawaiiite was harder than anything the Polynesians had ever encountered before. They quickly learned to shape it into a variety of useful tools. Which made it possible for the Polynesians to farm on a much larger scale than they had on their home islands. They made sharp axes to clear land and build complex irrigation systems. They made chisels and knives, hoes and spades. The discovery of Hawaiiite by the Polynesian settlers was as important to their culture as the Bronze Age was to Europe. It transformed Hawaii's landscape in ways that can still be seen today. Polynesians became Hawaiians. But Hawaii would never have become such a land of plenty if not for one tiny seed carried in a tempest. When the Hawaiian Islands first emerged from the Pacific, they were virtually lifeless a blank slate on which nature could write whatever she wished. Almost immediately, she began to compose. The first obstacle to overcome was the island's sheer remoteness. Separated from the nearest continent by thousands of miles of ocean, the odds were stacked against any life reaching here at all. But life somehow managed to beat the odds. The first to do it were plants. They owe their whole existence on Hawaii to the weather. Huge storms created powerful vortexes of wind. These sucked tiny seeds high into the air from lands all around the Pacific, carried them thousands of miles on the jet stream, and finally dropped them onto the virgin ground of Hawaii. Most of these seeds died on arrival. There was no soil here, and few nutrients. It was a tough neighborhood. But one colonist survived where all others had failed, by adapting to Hawaii's barren landscape. The Ahia Lahua. Unique to Hawaii, the secret to its success is rooted in the lava, literally because the ahia lahua doesn't need soil to grow. Its roots have evolved to find nutrients in the most hostile environments. Even in the maze of dank tunnels that riddle the underground landscape of Hawaii. Tunnels that are only here because of a remarkable volcanic phenomenon. degrees Fahrenheit. Pohoihoi is the hottest and fastest flowing type of lava on the planet. Like cooling oatmeal, it quickly forms a skin when exposed to air. A skin that eventually encases the lava stream in a tunnel 
a lava tube. When the flow stops, tubes empty and remain hollow. The last ripples of the lava flow harden in the lava tube floor. And the final molten gasps hang from the roof in formations called lava sickles. Water that seeps into the lava tubes is slow to dry out. Of all the plants on Hawaii, only the Ahia Lahua's roots penetrate so deeply they can take advantage of this underground moisture. The Ahia Lahua was so successful, millions of these trees now cover the islands and can grow to be over 80 feet tall. Found nowhere else on Earth, they made all the difference here in Hawaii. Because these resilient plants that could thrive even without soil became the soil for the next wave of plant species as they decayed and composted. And so, the Hawaiian islands gradually changed from desolate black to lush green. and Hawaii's now abundant plant life attracted the next wave of immigrants who flew here under their own steam. Bugs. But not just any bugs. Meet the fruit fly. Now, everyone knows that Hawaii is the place for hot-blooded young lovers. And flies are no exception. A little rough stuff between the guys competing for the gals. Some seductive dancing with three left feet. And the next generation is on the way. More than a thousand species of fruit fly have evolved here and nowhere else. Scientists studying their DNA were astonished to discover that every one of them is descended from a single pregnant female. The Eve of Hawaiian fruit flies. For a time, these insects had a free pass on Hawaii. There weren't any predators here, yet. But over time, a meek vegetarian rose to the occasion and became a ferocious carnivore. This caterpillar is the Eupithecia, a master of disguise. He has special Brazilian rubber on his shoes, which makes him jump to a he wears the lightest shorts allowed by the NBA. That's why his hang time is so long. His head's aerodynamic and you know. Now he's so fast, he can pass the rock himself. You know what I heard? Every time Grant Hill drinks Sprite, he's not thirsty anymore. Hundreds of species of Eupithecia exist all over the world, but Hawaii is the only place where they eat meat. Some 30,000 years after its emergence from the sea, Hawaii had become an Eden for flora and fauna. Well, at least for those that didn't mind being just a little flexible. Among the first feathered settlers, Hawaiian honey creepers evolved from a single species of finch, a flock of rose finches that happened to arrive in Hawaii from Eurasia. With no competition from other land birds, they blossomed into many different species, 
each specially adapted to eat the foods Hawaii had in abundance. This honey creeper behaves like a woodpecker pecking for insects. This one sucks the sap from trees. And some have developed unusual beaks adapted to fit very particular kinds of Hawaiian flowers. Many honey creepers were wiped out by disease after the first human settlers arrived. But it wouldn't be long before the Hawaiians found themselves on the brink of extinction. ancient Hawaiian festival of Thanksgiving, Makahiki, celebrated a successful harvest and honored the local fertility god, Lono. Hawaiian mythology prophesied that Lono would visit during this festival and arrive by sea. And sure enough, during one Makahiki, a huge sailing ship hove into view. The Hawaiians were sure it was Lono. In fact, it was the famed British explorer, Captain James Cook. Cook arrived at the Big Island on January 16, 1779. He was welcomed as a god and did nothing to deny it. The British exploited this case of mistaken identity to the hilt, repairing their ships and taking on food and water. They stayed 19 days. 19 days that would change the history of Hawaii forever. When Cook set off, bound for home, the weather closed in. Five days out, he was driven back to the shelter of the islands. This time, there was no divine welcome. Surely a god would have been able to control the weather. Just settled, Captain Cook was dead. But his crew lived to tell the tale. And that meant Hawaii's centuries of isolation were at an end. Within 10 years, outsiders were racing to exploit the newly discovered islands. Sandalwood was shipped to China. Guano went to North America to make fertilizer. Whole colonies of sooty terns were killed off for their exotic tail feathers, shipped off to grace the latest hats in Paris, London, and New York. But some American entrepreneurs weren't content to simply export the natural treasures they found in Hawaii. They wanted the place itself and they wanted it because of its climate. Hawaii's climate is determined by its isolation. Winds that reach its remote shores have blown across thousands of miles of ocean, picking up tons of moisture along the way. When the winds hit the islands, the air rises cools, and releases its water. 
Over 450 inches of rain can fall on this side of the island of Kauai every year, making it the wettest place on Earth. All this water, along with the abundance of sunshine, made 19th century American businessmen see dollar signs. In Hawaii, they had found the ideal conditions for growing the big money crop of the day, sugar. But there was a hitch. They needed local manpower to build and farm the plantations. And Captain Cook's visit had made that somewhat problematic. Because the British had brought ashore diseases that the Hawaiians had never encountered before, and to which they had no immunity. It only took a century for illnesses like mumps and cholera to reduce the population of native Hawaiians by 90% from some 400,000 to just 40,000. Which meant that more than 300,000 workers had to be shipped in from all over the world. Just 100 years after the first plantation started up, sugar farming had become a massive success churning out more than a million tons of the stuff each year. So a chance encounter with a British explorer back in the 18th century explains why today Hawaii is home to Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Portuguese, and Filipinos. The Hawaiian Islands are one of the most ethnically diverse places on Earth. They're also the most climatically diverse. And the coldest and highest of its climate zones is perfect for these. From space, the human footprint shines brightly maybe a little too brightly. Light pollution means the night sky in most parts of the world is no longer jet black, but dull gray. Out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far away from the bright lights of North America, it's a different story. The dark sky has made this the perfect place for stargazing. The world's largest collection of space telescopes, the Mauna Kea Observatory, the Big Island's dormant volcano provides a clear view in all four dimensions. Not only is it far from the light pollution of the mainland, but it also sits nearly three miles above sea level. That's crucial because at this altitude, astronomers are looking through half the amount of air they would have to at sea level. And the less air, the sharper the image. Hawaii's telescopes have helped us to discover moons of Jupiter and Saturn that we never knew existed. Planets outside our solar system and even entire galaxies that had never been seen before. But this location won't be ideal forever. Because the same geological forces that created Hawaii are still at work. The entire Pacific plate is moving. four inches every year. And as it travels, it takes the Hawaiian Islands right along with it. 
as if they were on an enormous conveyor belt. As they head north and are pulled off the Hawaiian hotspot, they will sink under their own weight back into the Earth's crust. At the same time, waves, wind, and rain will gradually erode them away to mere atolls. In only 10 million years, a hiccup in geological time, the mountainous island of Kauai, more than a mile high, will disappear beneath the waves. It'll look like this, a tiny island which itself was once a great mountain. The Hawaiian Islands may look as though they've been there forever, but the islands we see today are only the latest in a chain that has been built and eroded away many times over the last 82 million years. The result is a range of underwater mountains that stretches all the way to Alaska. At the far end, nearly 3,000 miles away, is a fiery grave in the Aleutian Trench where the islands are swallowed back into the earth. But that's not the end of the story. Not by a long shot. Because deep under the ocean, at the start of the chain, that original hotspot is still hard at work. surface, it's already bigger than Mount St. Helens. In 10,000 years, Loihi will emerge from the Pacific, a blank sheet on which nature once again can compose her ancient tale.